Your body contains an incredible superhighway of data transfer, taking information from your gut and changing your brain. It also goes the other way with data from your brain changing your gut. What I'm talking about here is the gut-brain connection. And this has absolutely revolutionized the way that we think about neuroscience. In particular, the gut-brain connection is so interesting because it allows us to understand how various aspects of our diet and the foods that we eat can have such significant impact on our brain function. If you have any interest in understanding how certain foods can influence your gut-brain connection for the better or and for the worse, you're going to want to pay attention to this video. I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. I'm an internal medicine physician, but I'm largely focused on strategies to help you to protect your brain tomorrow and to improve and optimize your brain function today. If you're new to my channel, that's what this is all about. Please consider subscribing. It's incredibly helpful to me. Last thing I'll say before we jump into the science, this is for general education purposes only. This is not designed to take the place of getting medical care. So let's talk about the gut-brain connection, and we're going to talk about some of the ways in which data gets transferred, mostly from the gut to the brain. Again, it goes both directions. And then we're going to talk about how certain foods may have a outsized influence for the better and for the worse on your gut-brain connection, and what are some generally practical strategies to look at around which foods to eat more of and which foods to eat less of. So thinking about how these foods influence the brain. Generally speaking, Understand that the gut-brain connection, again, is a bi-directional highway, that information goes both directions. One of the most important systems that influences the information transfer is going to be the enteric nervous system. So the enteric nervous system is sometimes described as the second brain. The enteric nervous system, or the ENS, is located throughout the gut, really within the gut wall. It contains over 100 million neurons, and what it does is, not only does it regulate digestion, but it sends data to the brain. We also know, and you've probably heard, that the vagus nerve, your longest cranial nerve, has all of these nerve endings that terminate within the gut. The majority of nerve fibers for the vagus nerve run from the gut to the brain, which means that the majority of the vagus nerve function seems to be conduit for data going from the gut to the brain. This is often described as the single most important physical connection between the gut and the brain. So when you eat different foods, we know that the vagus nerve is able to detect certain molecules either within those foods or molecules that are changed downstream from those foods. Some of that downstream change is actually going to relate to the microbiome. So the microbiome is another major component, another major part of this gut-brain connection. The gut microbiome contains tens of trillions of bacteria, fungi, other microorganisms. And we know that these microorganisms produce a host of different molecules like serotonin and gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA. We also know that they're involved in the secondary metabolites that are produced when they consume things like fiber. The bottom line here is to understand that the microbiome, all of these microbes that live on the outside of our gut, can play a significant role, both in terms of what they do to food and in terms of other pathways that sub subsequently influence what's happening within the brain. So when we talk about various foods, both the healthy foods and the unhealthy foods, their impact on the microbiome is going to be very critical to understanding their potential role in supporting the gut-brain connection. We also need to understand that the immune system plays a major role in the gut-brain connection. A large percentage of the immune system is located in the gut. We have all this immune tissue, all these immune cells, and what we know is that the state of the immune system has a major impact on the state of our brain health, and that the state of the gut immune system is influenced by interactions between diet and the microbiome and our gut cells. The last conduit, the last piece of this communication signaling is the endocrine system. So the endocrine system produces hormones. Hormones have effects that occur 
far away from where the initial signal is produced. And we know that there are a number of different hormones produced by the endocrine system in the gut. These include molecules like ghrelin and leptin, which you may have heard of in the context of satiety or hunger, ghrelin being more of a hunger hormone and leptin being more of a satiety hormone, but also GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, which has gained a lot of interest more recently because of medications that target this pathway. The bottom line here is to understand that one of the key components of what influences the brain through the gut and that is influenced by the food that we eat is the endocrine system in part because of these molecules like leptin, ghrelin, and GLP-1, even though there are a number of other molecules produced by the gut hormone system or gut endocrine system that influence the gut brain connection. Okay, so with all of this as background, let's get into the interesting stuff. Let's talk about some of the foods that can benefit or perhaps detract from the health of the gut brain connection. Let's begin with some of the top foods to eat more of or to consider eating more of as it relates to promoting a healthy gut brain connection. The first of these groups of foods are polyphenol rich foods. What are polyphenols? Well, polyphenols are actually very straightforward described based on their molecular structure. They have multiple phenolic rings. Polyphenols are the things that give plants their colors, specifically fruits and vegetables. What you're seeing in terms of those colors are actually the polyphenols within the plant. And what's interesting about polyphenols is that they are used by plants as part of their own defense system. So plants produce polyphenols to defend themselves against UV radiation, against microbes, but they also use them as signaling molecules. So this is very interesting for plants. What does it mean for humans? We now understand that polyphenols are far more than just antioxidants. For a long time, it was thought that polyphenols are simply antioxidants, again, because of their chemical structure. We now know that polyphenols can act as prebiotics, which mean that when we eat polyphenols, it can change the gut microbiome in a beneficial way, subsequently having a beneficial effect on the gut brain connection. We also know that research published in the last 10 to 20 years shows that polyphenols may act on immune, metabolic, and other pathways that regulate overall and brain health. That's really important. There's actually research that a group that I'm involved with just published showing how polyphenols may additionally act to change DNA expression, meaning they change the way that our DNA is being used. So the bottom line here is to understand that eating colorful fruits and vegetables, spices and herbs that are high in polyphenols, even coffee and tea, and to a lesser extent, red wine, if there are effects that are having, happening as a function of these molecules found naturally within basically plant-based foods. Polyphenols are also found within certain animal-based foods, and it does seem like the polyphenol cohort may be different in something like a grass-fed animal, for example, beef, as opposed to a grain-fed or feedlot-based beef or, or a cow. So that's really interesting to consider. But by and large, if you're trying to get higher concentrations of polyphenols, your best bet is to eat them in plant-based sources. Food number two to eat more of to support a healthy gut-brain connection is going to be fiber-rich foods. Now, there is some conversation around fiber, whether people should eat more fiber or less fiber. By and large, when you look at population level data, people who eat more fiber tend to do better. People who eat more fiber have better immune function, better metabolic function. They may even live longer. They also seem to have better brain function. So that's really interesting. Getting not enough fiber or insufficient fiber intake seems to have the opposite effect. There are two different types of fiber. There's an overlap, but we usually we think about insoluble fiber as the fiber that provides bulk for stool with helping with regular bowel movements. Soluble fiber contains the prebiotic fiber. So this is the fiber that feeds our microbiome. What are good sources of dietary fiber? Whole grains, oats, legumes. Uh, if you really wanna think about kind of prebiotic fiber, fiber that's been studied to have a beneficial effect on the gut microbiome, then you're thinking about a little bit more esoteric foods, sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, you can think about dandelion greens. But what I would say to focus on is simply eating more whole plant-based foods. So that includes leafy greens and nuts and seeds and fruits. And as I mentioned, whole grains. I think these are generally good considerations. The closer you eat to something that can be found in nature and that is plant-based, the higher your chances are of getting more fiber in your diet. The third group of foods that are worthy of consideration that are really 
being studied increasingly to promote a healthy gut-brain connection are fermented foods. Fermented foods kind of by definition contain probiotics, meaning they have microbes in them that may be helpful to our gut health. So there are a number of different bacteria primarily that can be found in different fermented foods. The idea here is that if we eat fermented foods that contain healthy microbes, it may benefit the microbiome, improve digestion, and by doing so help to regulate the gut-brain connection. By and large, the data supporting fermented foods tends to be a bit more preclinical, which means there's not a ton of great data showing how eating certain fermented foods leads to specific health outcomes in humans. But generally speaking, there seems to be a signal that eating more fermented food is linked to benefit to pathways in relationship to gut brain health. Some fermented foods to consider yogurt, but don't get the flavored sugary yogurt. We're talking about plain yogurt with live cultures, uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, Kombucha can be an option, but often it's very high in sugar, but it is a source of fermented food. But really what you're trying to do here is consider eating foods that have some live and healthy bacteria without going down the road of basically eating something with a ton of added sugar. And you think that you're getting a net benefit, but you're also consuming a lot of added sugar, which as we'll talk about in a moment, is really something worthy of avoiding if we're trying to promote a healthy gut brain connection. The last group of foods I wanted to mention here as it relates to having a positive impact on the gut-brain connection are going to be fatty fish. Now, you may not think about fish as something that have anything to do with gut health, but consider one of the molecules within fatty fish uh, are actually omega-3s, specifically DHA and EPA. These are regulators of immune function, and they're linked to better brain health. Some research actually shows that omega-3 consumption may benefit the gut microbiome which is a new way of thinking about the potential effects of these molecules. What should you eat if your goal is to eat more healthy omega-3s? So good sources would be salmon, mackerel, sardines, anchovies. What you wanna look for here are really smaller fish because smaller fish can be concentrated in these omega-3s, but tend to have a lower level of potential toxins like mercury and other heavy metals. Um, also cold water fish tend to be a bit higher in omega-3s than warm water fish. What if you don't eat fish? What if you are a vegan? Well, you might consider an algae-based supplement. Uh, these have become increasingly popular. I will say you can get omega-3 precursors. I guess they're technically, it is an omega-3, but you can get precursors to DHA and EPA in things like nuts and seeds. And that is interesting, but by and large, our bodies don't convert to DHA and EPA at high enough levels to where that may be as relevant as taking, if you're a vegan, an algae-based supplement. Okay, so these are some of the foods that we would recommend eating less of, or sorry, more of, if you were trying to promote a healthy gut-brain connection. What are the foods you should consider eating less of if you want to promote a healthy gut-brain connection? One of those foods I've already alluded to, it's added sugar. Added sugar is really of no benefit to almost anyone. Eating more added sugar contributes to immune dysfunction throughout the body, including within the gut. Added sugar is believed to contribute to higher rates of cognitive issues, mood disorders, and much more. And one of those pathways appears to be through what added sugar does within the gut. Generally speaking, my recommendation for most people is to avoid foods with added sugar and especially to avoid any beverages with added sugar. Those tend to be the kind of worst scenario as it relates to overall health partially because they don't contain anything like fiber that blunts the sugar. We're still learning about whether there are deficits that come from added sugars, or I should say artificial sweeteners. From the data that I've seen so far, stevia, monk fruit, and allulose may be the healthier versions of sugar alternatives, as opposed to things like sucralose, uh, aspartame. But we're still learning more about sugar alternatives. What I would say in a perfect world is we're decreasing our reliance on sugary and sweet foods, specifically added sugars. If we choose to eat things that are naturally sweetened, like a piece of fruit that comes with fiber and polyphenols, that seems like a much better vote for gut-brain connection and gut-brain health. Number two in terms of foods to consider avoiding if you're trying to promote gut-brain health would be anything that is highly processed. The more a food has been modified from its original state, and that can be with additives, emulsifiers, sugars, salts, and fats, generally speaking, the better the chances that's not a good option for the gut-brain connection. When we look at primarily preclinical data, processed food consumption is linked to inflammation, 
to higher gut permeability and to microbiome changes. When we look at human data, observational data, because we're not randomizing trials where people are eating a ton of ultra processed foods, people who eat more ultra processed foods appear to have higher rates of gut specific diseases and disorders. So generally speaking, eating less highly processed food is a top recommendation basically regardless of where you hear uh, health information on diet, everyone would recommend eating less ultra processed or highly processed food. And it seems to be a particularly good vote as you're trying to protect your gut brain connection. The third and the final food that I think is worthy of avoidance if we're trying to protect a healthy gut brain connection is excess alcohol. There are some data suggesting that low to moderate amounts of alcohol consumption are linked to better brain health outcomes, even though preclinical and certainly cell level data suggest that alcohol is a neurotoxin. But what we would say is that excess alcohol consumption absolutely is correlated with worse brain health, and that some of these changes may actually occur by what's happening in the gut, meaning consuming excess alcohol may damage the gut, leading to damage to the brain. So what are the recommendations? Recommendations would generally be uh, between uh, one to two alcoholic beverages a day if you are a male, and less one or less if you are a woman. Now, these are not necessarily going to be universal depending on every person, but this is perhaps an interesting place to start. So we've covered a lot of different ideas here as it relates to protecting your gut brain connection. If you're curious about getting any of the references to the studies or just generally to the data that I mentioned, I will add a link here to the full length blog on my website that'll have all the research available for you. Again, if you're not already a subscriber to my channel, consider subscribing. You'll get all this access to practical brain science. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for watching.